Good evening, High Point family. Shelly Vincent Bullock here, and I'm here to greet you on behalf of our pastors, Dr. Apostle Thomas H. Vincent and co-pastor Dr. Carolyn Vincent. We are so excited that you joined us tonight for our Wednesday night Bible study. We are so excited about the word tonight and we want you to get excited too because this is the day that the Lord has made. We're determined to rejoice and be glad in it. If you are watching via social media, we want you to hit your share buttons to share this word with somebody who needs to hear it tonight. We want to be witnesses and we want to share the word with those that may not be saved or may not know the Lord. Tonight, we are going to be receiving a great word from our very own Elder Jimmy White. So we want you guys to gather all of your note-taking materials and your Bibles and get ready to dive into the word as we go right into our Bible study. Hello, my name is Elder Jimmy White, High Point Christian Tabernacle, located in Smyrna, Georgia where the pastor is Thomas H. Vinson, and co-pastor is Dr. Carolyn Vinson. Um, tonight, our lesson is uh, Redeemed by the Blood of Jesus. Redeemed by the Blood of Jesus. Um, we have a lot of territory to cover tonight, so we'll go ahead and get started. But before we get started, first want to acknowledge our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, acknowledge again the pastor and co-pastor, the angels of our church, Thomas H. Vincent, Dr. Carolyn Vincent, and also uh, my wife of 43 years, uh, my, 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 my children, and also the saints uh, of God. And getting started here, um, let's go to our scripture and coming out of Genesis 2, 7, for God formed man in his own image. Scripture then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the earth and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Genesis 2, 7. Thus man became a living soul that will live forever, either in heaven or in hell. In Luke chapter 16, verses 22 to 23, Scripture reads, and it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and seeing Abraham afar off, Lazarus in his bosom. Jesus himself gives a real and accurate description of the eternal place of the soul. He gives an accurate place of return, eternal place of the soul. Now, remember earlier I had said, or we had read that God breathed into man and he became a living soul. So it's not the body that is in heaven or in hell at this time. It is the soul. So you see the soul, because God breathes in it, is going to live forever. But the soul, because, uh, it, it, because of, of the way God made it, it's, it's going to be one place or another, and it's going to live, all, live forever. So when you're looking at me, you, you don't really see me. You just see my body, but the one that's pulling the, the strings is my soul, the immaterial man. What you're seeing is a material man, but the immaterial is, is the soul, and it's going to live forever. But it is either going to be in heaven or in hell. But if it's going to be in heaven, to be in God's presence, it has to be redeemed. It has to be cleaned up because it, it, it was clean at first, but man corrupted it. So God formed man in his own image. Adam and Eve chose to sin against God. Sinning against God has terrible consequences that man cannot imagine. The result was that they were banished from the Garden of Eden no longer did Adam have a special relationship with God. God is a spirit. Now, before Adam and Eve sinned, they didn't realize the penalty that they would have to pay. Adam didn't realize that he was going to be banished from God or from his presence <clears throat> or, from the, or from the Garden of Eden. 
No longer did Adam have that special relationship with God. As I said earlier, God is a spirit. So therefore, I believe that Adam had some type of glorified body um, at that time to, to tabernacle with God before he sinned. Um, after sin, that was that, that was that was that was destroyed. It was severed. In the future, after millennium, Scripture lets us know that God will once again have that special relationship. Man will have that special relationship with God. And Scripture, and I heard a voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them, and they will be and, and will be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Revelation 21, verses 3 and 4. So it lets you know that in the beginning, we saw man was created. He had a special relationship with God. But because of sin, um, that, was, that, was, that was severed. And um, Adam and Eve were banished from the Garden of Eden, Eden and there were other consequences. But the, the thing is, they did not have that relationship or they couldn't tabernacle with God as they did before. And also a lot of things changed, but one of the things that has changed was that their nature had changed. So what? So this special glorified nature that that Adam had, it, it, it was gone. So now he had a sinful nature. And, and, and from then on, man was born with that, with that Adamic nature, or the original sin, or a sinful nature, or a natural nature. Because of God's love for us, he declared his plan of redemption to redeem man back to himself. Because God loved you and I, he did not accept that, uh, 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 even though Adam had sinned, he, 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 he still had his, have love for him, just as he has love for us. And he has a, so he has a plan of redemption to bring back that what was lost. In other words, a person go to a, a pawn shop and, and, he, and, he, and he purchases an item or he retrieves an item and he brings it back or he redeems it and he, he pays a price for it. So in this case, it was blood. So God's plan of redemption required blood. We're going to talk about this furthermore. Because of God's love for us, he declared his plan of redemption and to redeem man back to himself. So when Adam and Eve had fell into sin, Satan appeared to have ruined God's plans for a righteous, undying humanity to rule the earth to God's glory. See, in the beginning, Adam was a ruler and that before he fell, but after in the, Rev, Rev, the revelations lets us know that man will again rule. So you see, it's going to take about five or 6,000 years to, uh, for God's plan of redemption uh, to be complete from the beginning of the ending. But in the ending, he is going to still have him a redeemed people who love him and who will obey him to, to, to sit with him and tabernacle with him. Yet immediately after the fall, God promised a redeemer, the seed of a woman who would one day come and crush the serpent. Scripture, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Genesis 3.15. In Genesis 3.15, God announces the enmity that would come between Satan and mankind. This is the proto-evangelum. The proto-evangelum. Proto, the first evangelum gospel. 
The first announcement of the gospel in scripture. God himself declared and preaches the first gospel in Genesis 3.15. To some people, it is, it is confusing. It's, a, it's an enigma. But as we go on, we will see, and we study about the blood, we will see how is it the first gospel? How is it that this is going to come to pass? Because it has come to pass. And we'll show you. While the wound of sin was still fresh before the first scar was formed, God unveiled his plan to send a fully human redeemer who would be far more powerful than Satan. I want to pause right there. A lot of people think that uh, Satan is God's equal. He's not God's equal. God doesn't have an equal. Uh, if Satan does have an equal, it's probably Michael. But, it, but it's not God. And it's not Jesus because Jesus is God. Jesus is, Jesus is God manifested in the flesh. He doesn't have no equal. Uh, uh, in a courageous act of intervention to deliver mankind, this Redeemer would deliver a mortal wound to the devil and in the process would be wounded himself. In the process, he would be wounded himself. In, in typology, Jesus entered the tabernacle. He went behind the veil into the most holy place and there offered his own blood. Through his sacrifice and atonement, we have direct access to the throne of God. The Son is our high priest through whom we can boldly approach God. We'll be talking more about how is this possible? How is the Son our high priest through whom we can boldly approach God. How did this happen? Because last we read, man was, or Adam was, 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 was kicked out of the Garden of Eden. Old Testament sacrifices. The Old Testament sacrifices are clearly intended to be a typical foreshadowing of the sacrifice of Christ. Almost every aspect of meaning of death of Christ is anticipated. Central in the sacrifice is the future feature of shed blood. Looking forward to the shed blood, this explanation given in the Old Testament is the blood that was given and shed to make atonement. We'll talk about that very soon. Atonement. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it unto you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh atonement by reason of life. This central truth dominates the typology of sacrifices. <clears throat> Most important, the proto-evangelium or, 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 or the first gospel may declare that one day God would send one who would defeat God's enemy. This would allow for the restoration of everything to God's original design and restore man position as a theocratic administrator. So you remember that at one time, Adam was a theocratic administrator. Well, in the end, we're going to be theocratic administrators, but we have to be redeemed by the blood. God has plans for you and for I, for me. He has plans for us. <clears throat> to redeem man required blood. When Adam sinned, an animal died to shed his skin to provide a covering for Adam and Eve. The sacrifice of the Old Testament are clearly intended to be a typical foreshadowing of the sacrifice of Christ. Almost every aspect of the meaning of the death of Christ is anticipated. And this is the picture of the Old Testament tabernacle. Now, this, this tabernacle here is built 
according to Moses' instructions that God gave Moses. It is a prototype of heaven, the heavenly tabernacle. You have, you have the lamb, you have the brazen altar, you, you, have, you have the, uh, the, the holies of holies, you have the high priest. Um, but it is a prototype of the heavenly tabernacle. Now I'm not going to uh, go into the tabernacle because it, it's quite extensive. But just know that this is a prototype. The explanation given in the Old Testament is the blood was given, was shed to make an atonement for the life. We're going to go over it several times. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it unto you upon the altar to make atonement for your sins. For it is the blood that maketh atonement by reason of life. The Central truth dominates the typology of sacrifices. I think I already mentioned that. Because of the sin of violence and debauchery in the land, God destroyed the earth. Man chose sin over God. But God brought forth a new earth from the dreadful baptism of water. We're talking about when God destroyed the earth during the days of Noah. Um, there was much sin and much debauchery that it had to be destroyed. And in looking at it, God destroyed it by a dreadful baptism of water. Notice that the new earth was also baptized with blood. A lot of people died. And the first recorded act of Noah after he had left the ark was an offering of burnt sacrifice to God. As with Abel in the beginning and so with Noah at the new beginning, connection with God was not without blood. Remember God is immutable. He does not change. Malachi uh, 3.6 says, I the Lord do not change. For God is the same today, yesterday, and forever. He changed not. See, God never changes. It is us that changes. But God has been true to his word. Now, see, you got to remember that um, God required blood way back then, and he requires blood today. Nothing has changed. Only thing has changed is that we have a high priest who had already shed his blood. And made a way for us. And we're gonna, I don't want to jump too headed in our lesson. But but remember, God is immutable. Immutable means that He does not change. He does not change. Now, we had read where the earth was destroyed by Noah. Well, excuse me, the earth was destroyed during the days of Noah by great violence, sin, and debauchery. God had to destroy it. Now, sin is the poison. It was the poison then, and it's the poison today. Sin is the poison. The, but the blood of Jesus is the antidote. So, for those who choose to, who have been poisoned by sin, all you have to do is reach out and take the antidote. And the antidote is the blood of Jesus. And there is no other antidote. Because of the wages of sin, every person born after Adam was cursed with the original sin. Man's nature had changed to become the natural man with a sinful nature. And that's how we're born today. The natural the man man is born with a natural as a natural man with a sinful nature. With this nature, mankind cannot tabernacle with God. To tabernacle with God that is revealed in Revelations 21, you must be redeemed by the blood of Jesus. Remember Jesus said in the scripture, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man has come to the Father but through me. Jesus is the only way. I know there's other religions and other things, but Jesus is the only way. Nobody shed their blood for you but Jesus. Nobody rose from the dead but Jesus. Nobody's coming back for you again but Jesus. Without blood, there could be no access to a holy, to a, to a holy throne. To 
a holy God whose throne is in heaven. If a person asks what lies beyond the holy place in the tabernacle, you will be told that it was it's the most holy place where God dwells. If you ask how he dwells there and, and how he and, and how is he approached, you know, uh, we know in the study of the tabernacle that you will be told not without blood. The golden throne where his glory shines itself is sprinkled with blood once a year. And that was that was the atoning. When the high priest atones, when the high priest alone enters to bring the blood and to worship God, the highest act in the worship is the sprinkling of the blood. Sprinkling of the blood. Okay. Um, as I mentioned earlier, God is immutable. He cannot change. I, the Lord, do not change. So you, so you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, forevermore. Um, I'm going to go all the way down to the last two bullets. Isaiah 53, we read that he was led like a lamb to the slaughter. Up to this point, the sacrificial lamb has always been an animal. But now, Isaiah shows us that the Lamb of God is a person on who will be pierced for our transgression. 700 years later, John the, Apostle, John the Apostle is the first person to identify Jesus as the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. To take away the sin required blood. Nothing's changed. You see, Jesus... Uh, in, the, in the Old Testament, you had the Lamb. In the New Testament, you have Jesus, who is the Lamb, the Lamb of God. And he was identified. Redemption by the blood. Redemption by the blood. Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, like silver or gold, from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Jesus, as of a lamb without blemish and spot. First Peter, uh, eight, uh, First Peter, eighteen and nineteen. The Lord Jesus plainly declared that his death on the cross was the purpose for which he came into the world. Remember. God's plan of redemption. He announced in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, that he was going to redeem his people. And, and, and part of God's plan of redemption is to be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And God's plan is, is, is to clean us up so that we will be in heaven, so we will, we will have a glorified body, and that we would be with him and tabernacle with him. The Lord Jesus Christ, um, excuse me, the Lord's death was the means of redemption and the life that he came to bring. He clearly states that the shedding of blood was necessary in his death. He took the, the cup at the Last Supper and saying, this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sin, Matthew 26, 28. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins, Hebrews 9, 22. Without the remission of sin, there is no life, but by the shedding of the blood. Now you're beginning to see how important the blood is. He obtained a new life for us. The blood which was shed in the atonement frees us from the guilt of sin and from death and the punishment of sin. The blood which by faith we receive into our soul gives us this life. So you see, we must be covered by the blood of Jesus. In the Old Testament, Exodus 12, 13, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No plague will befall, will befall you to destroy you. Now, notice that it, it looks almost like a cross. You have the blood on the, on the lentil and the blood on the pulse. 
but there is no blood on the ground. Um, um, there is no blood on the ground. It is on the, on the post. At no time will the blood of Jesus be stepped on. It's the blood on the post, on the lintel. Now, if you stay underneath that covering, then you will be safe. But you come out underneath that covering, and anything can happen to you because you'll be you be in the devil's territory, and that still goes today. We must stay under the saints of God. Must stay under the blood of Jesus. Stay under the blood of Christ, and and God will protect you. He will take care of you. Are you saying that nothing's going to happen to me? Well, I, what I'm saying is we're all going to go through things, but we're going to go through under the blood. There's only, there's only so far the devil can go. But when you get out from under the blood and you go places you shouldn't go and you do things that you shouldn't do, you get out from under the blood, you, you, could, you could not only lose your life, you could lose your soul. Because remember, you can't see the soul and you, 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 can't, you can't see God. You can't see the devil. It's a spiritual warfare that's going on. And, 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 and what we see in the body, we can only see so much. But if we were able to put on our spiritual glasses, we could see warfare going on. So you must stay under the blood. If God tells you to stay under the blood, stay under the blood. He knows what he's talking about. The blood, the trail of the blood, uh, there is a trail of blood stretching from the Garden of Eden to the New Jerusalem, from Genesis to Revelations. This crimson thread tells us how God reclaimed paradise for fallen sinners and how he saved us from death and restored us unto glory. Now, we, we're gonna see that God has a plan for us. We had mentioned that earlier. And a couple of broadcasts, I talked about heaven, but I, I didn't go into a lot of detail. Maybe one day we'll have a lesson on heaven and, and also a lesson on hell. But the lesson on heaven, God has, as I said earlier, he has a lot of plans for you. Now, um, I, I had mentioned earlier that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. You have to be justified. You have to be sanctified. Being justified and being sanctified will, uh, will then, if you stay sanctified, you will become glorified. You stay under the blood, you will become glorified. Now, uh, earlier I had mentioned about atonement. Atonement. The Bible says much about the blood, especially in connection with the atonement. The New Testament theology of atonement is grounded on Old Testament practice of animal sacrifice. Remember I showed you the picture? The law of Moses pres prescribed animal sacrifices as a sin offering. The Hebrew word uh, translated atone is, is, is linked to the idea of ransom. To atone is to ransom or redeem by offering a substitute. In the Old Testament sacrificial system, this ransom involved blood sacrifice. Atonement. Christ was our sacrificial lamb. Christ was our sacrificial lamb. In the Old Testament, the righteousness of God's judgment required blood. Remember when I told you earlier that God is immutable. He doesn't change. He required blood then, he required blood now. In the Old Testament tabernacle, the Levitical high priest sacrificed a lamb to atone for the sins of people once a year. Remember when, when God gave instructions to build the tabernacle, I told you it was, a, it was a prototype of the heavenly tabernacle in heaven. Scripture shows us the tabernacle is a model of the sanctuary temple of God in some manner. Exodus 25, 8 through 9, Hebrews 8 and 4. Moses made tabernacle altars, all copies of the heavenly 
pattern. Um, now, Christ dying on the cross, shedding his blood. We identify that he is the Lamb of God, a perfect Lamb, who shed his blood to atone for our sins. He didn't do anything, we did. In the simplest terms, in the simplest terms, the Bible doctrine of penal, vicarious, substitutional atonement, penal, um, Justice, vicarious for all, substitutionary. He took he took our he took our place, atonement. He atoned for our sins as our high priest once a year. Uh, penal, vicarious, substitutionary atonement holds that Jesus' sacrifice on the cross takes the place of punishment. We ought to suffer for our own sins. As a result, God's justice is satisfied. Those who, those who accept Christ can be forgiven and reconciled unto, unto God. You see, to be justified, we have to accept Christ. The word penal related to uh, punishment, to uh, offenses and substitution means an act of taking the place of another. So penal substitu substitution is an act of taking punishment for someone else, someone else's offenses. In Christian theology, Jesus Christ is a substitute and the punishment he took on the cross was ours, based on our sin. According to the doctrine of penal substitution, God's perfect justice demands some form of atonement for, for sin. Humanity deprived to such extent that we are spiritually dead and capable of atoning, atoning for any sin in any way. Penal substitution means God's death on the cross was satisfied, God's requirement for justice. God's mercy allows Jesus to take the punishment we deserve for our sins. As a result, sacrifice serves as a substitute for anyone who accepts it. In the very direct sense, Jesus is exchanged for the receipt of sin's penalty. Redemption. Redemption. But before I get into redemption, I, I want to mention the atonement. If you take atonement and you cut it in half or three pieces at one moment, Jesus, who is our high priest, had to atone for our sins only one time by his blood. No longer was a Levitical priest needed because Jesus became our high priest. God did it. When, 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 the, when, when Jesus died on the cross, the thick veil in the temple was rent from, from the top to the bottom. God did it. He was showing that he did it. And there was nothing nobody else could do about it. God showed them that Jesus was now our high priest. Because Jesus said a while back, he said, he said, I am the way, and there is no other. And Jesus had told us in several ways that he is the way, and he is the only way. And he has also become our high priest, and he's the only way to salvation. Jesus, as I said earlier, he said, that I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through me, John 14, 6. But Christ came, but Christ being come, excuse me, but Christ becoming a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is to say, not of a building. Neither by the blood of goats or calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us, for the blood of bulls and goats and ashes of heifers and the sprinkling unclean sanctifies to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Jesus Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from the dead works 
to the to serve the living God. Jesus has become our high priest. No longer do we need the Levitical high priest anymore to go in to atone for our sins once a year. Jesus did it once and for all. He became our high priest. No longer did we need the veil, so God himself took that veil, which was about four inches thick, and ripped it in half. God did it. So it lets us know that we must be redeemed by the blood of Jesus and we must accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior to become our high priest. For this cause, he is a mediator of the New Testament that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgression that were under the First Testament, they were called, might receive the promise of eternal of eternal inheritance, Hebrews 9, um, chapter, uh, verses 11 through 15. They which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Remember in the beginning, I told you about you would be eternally in heaven or you'd be eternally in hell. Well, we're talking about eternal in heaven, inheritance, being with Christ. God has so much for you, but again, this lesson is on heaven this, this lesson is about the blood. But just remember, with that being said, that God said that, just remember, that you're going to, God said it out of his own mouth, that you're going to tabernacle with him eternally and forever. Okay. Redemption. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. We have all been redeemed, set free by the blood of Christ requires faith in Christ and are no longer held captive by past sin so that we may live a new and better way of life in present and in future. For in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in according to the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ, Ephesians 1. Now you see, God has a timeline, and maybe another time we'll talk about a timeline, but God has a timeline, and he is on schedule. And the next advent to happen is the return of uh, Jesus, we, he's going to first return and rapture the church. In, and uh, we'll talk more about that, but just remember the next thing to happen, the next event, next prophecy it, to, be fulfilled, to be fulfilled is when the Lord returns for his church. And, and I had mentioned to you earlier where John said, the next day John seeth Jesus coming and said, behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. And we had read the scripture that the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away the sin of the world. They can only provide a covering uh, year to year, like the sweeping of sins under the carpet. But as John the Baptist declared, Jesus is the lamb that takes away the sins of the world. He's the only one that can do it. Now, I've mentioned to you earlier about redemption. Redemption, knowing that ye have been ransomed, not with corruptible things like silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Jesus as a lamb, as a lamb without blemish and contamination. As a lamb without blemish. Jesus was the only one who could take away your sins. The word ransom literally means redeemed, has a, has a depth of meaning. It indicates particularly deliverance from slavery by emancipation of purpose, the sinner is enslaved under the hostile power of Satan, the curse of the law and sin. Now it is proclaimed you have been ransomed through the blood, the price which had, which had paid the debt of guilt and destroyed the power of Satan, the curse and sin. Remember the proto-evangelum? We have been set free by the blood of of Jesus. And justification is a declaration and a legal act. You're set free. No matter what we had done in the past, 
Jesus Christ is the only one who can set you free, and he has set you free. But you must be, it don't stop there, you must be, you must be, be born again. You must be washed in the blood of the Lamb. You must be baptized in Jesus' name. Jesus name. You must be regenerated. You must be filled with the Holy Ghost. But I'm kind of putting the things ahead here, so I'll, I'll go back to redemption. While this proclamation is heard and received, redemption begins in the true deliverance from a vain manner of life, from a life of sin. The word redemption or ransom includes everything God does for a sinner, beginning with the pardon of sin, given the Holy Ghost, which is earnest of our inheritance unto the redemption of the, of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Ephesians 1. Where does the power of the blood lie? Jesus said, you shall receive power. Where does the power of the blood lie? It goes all the way back. The power of the blood is found in Leviticus. For the soul or life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you to reconcile your persons or souls upon the altar. Therefore, the same blood reconciles that person. 1711. It is because the soul or life is in the blood and the blood is offered to God on the altar that it has that altar that it has in its redemptive power. The blood was thus the life given unto the satisfaction of the law of God and in obedience to his command, sin was entirely covered and atoned for. It was no longer reckoned as of a transgressor. He was forgiven, but all these sacrifices and offerings were only types of shadows until Jesus came. The blood was the reality to which some points, some types point, for he made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be the righteousness of God in him. 2 Corinthians 5 2, 1. The blood of Jesus has opened has opened the grave. The blood of Jesus has opened heaven. We have been reconciled. And Justification, justification, um, and Paul gives an overview of the process by which God applies salvation unto us. He mentions justification. He mentions justification. Those who he predestinated, he also called, and those whom he called, he also justified. Those whom justified, he also glorified, Romans. I mentioned before to you atonement. I'm running out of time, so I'm just going to highlight on some things. Atonement, if you take it, if you cut it in half, it's it's three words, at one moment. The high priest went once a year, but Jesus, one time, the atonement. Remember in the veil? God took the veil, and it was about four inches thick. And he rent it in half. For Christians, the rent means that we have a mediating high priest, Jesus. And that's in 1 Timothy uh, 2 5, who has opened the way for us to have access through the throne of God. Jesus became our high priest, and there is no other way except through Jesus Christ. The blood of Jesus. <clears throat> These are seven things that the blood of Jesus does for us. We're freed from the power of the devil. Our sins are forgiven if we confess them. We are put right with God, access to the presence of God. We are made holy. Our conscience are clear and we have no guilt given power over the devil. Justification. Uh, when Paul, I read earlier, those whom he predestinated, he also called. Those whom, and those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. 
The word called here refers to the effective calling of the gospel, which includes regeneration. Regeneration is another word for being filled with the Holy Ghost and brings forth response of repentance and faith or conversion on our part. After the effective calling, the response that initiates on our part, the next step in the application of redemption is justification. Here Paul mentions that this is something that God himself does. Those whom he called, he also justified. After you're being justified, and we, we have said justification frees you from sin, the blood of Jesus takes, takes the shackles off of you. No longer are you under the devil's control. No longer does he have any power over you. But next, you, you have to, is sanctification. And sanctification is another word for sanctified or holiness. You have to be sanctified. What sanctification does, it gives you power. Sanctification gives you power not to sin. So when when you when Jesus fills with the Holy Ghost, you, you're given power. And you and 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 it doesn't take you out of the presence of sin, but it gives you the power to say no to the devil. So you must also consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. You gotta stay under the blood. Remember I showed you earlier, you have to stay under the blood. Do not yield your members to sin as instruments of wickedness, but yield yourself to God as men who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments of righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under the law but under grace. You're no longer under the law, but you're under grace. But do not yield your members to sin as instruments of wickedness. Remember, you have, you have been purchased under the blood of Jesus, and you, you're covered by the blood of Jesus. You're covered. So, so don't go back into sin. Don't go back there. And then to those that endure, God has promised uh, many crowns. And one of them, one of the blessings is glorification. And see, to sit with God, to be with God, you got to have a glorified body. And a, and a glorified body is a, is a body that has been justified, that has been sanctified, uh, and, and washed in the blood, and, and then glorified. And, and you're cleaned up. And then once again, as God has promised in Revelation chapter 21, you will tabernacle with, with him again. Just like, just like with, uh, with Adam. But it's a process. And you have to do things God's way. Well, we're out of time. And I, and I, I could go on and on and on and on and on and on. But we're out of time. And I, I hope that you enjoyed this lesson. I want to encourage you to go and study all you can about the blood of Jesus and the, the power that's in the blood of Jesus. And, and for those who, are, who have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, I want to encourage you to do that and to get under the blood because we can see that time is winding up and the Lord is soon to return for his saints. So get ready to be ready for when the Lord comes. God bless you. We'll see you another time. How many thank God for that Bible study tonight? Thank you so much, Elder Jenny White, for that great word from the Lord. We truly, truly appreciate you, and thank you for helping us dive into the word a little deeper tonight. Now we want you all to turn your attention to giving. If you would like to give online, you can go to our website, www.highpointlive.org. Scroll to the bottom of the page and click on the donation tab. And there you can give of your tithes and your offerings.
If you are giving via mail, you can send it to High Point Christian Tabernacle at P.O. Box 813-699, Smyrna, Georgia 30081. Again, that's High Point Christian Tabernacle at P.O. Box 813-699, Smyrna, Georgia 30081. We want to thank all of you who have been supporting the ministry. We truly appreciate all of your donations and your tithes and your offerings. We thank God for our pastors and the vision that they have for the ministry. And we want to encourage you all to get involved in what we have going on at High Point. Now you do not have to register to come to our Sunday live worship services. So we want to invite you all to meet us Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. for our Sunday live worship services. Our Wednesday nights are still virtual services. So we want you to tune in via our website and our social media pages for our Wednesday night Bible classes and Wednesday night services. We have prayer every month and we also have two Bible studies a month and we have our point of view, which we want you guys to tune into at the end of the month. The brothers are taking over this point of view. So we want you to tune in to hear our apostle and the brothers in the Benson family who are going to be talking about a great topic this month. So have a great weekend. Thank you for joining us tonight for our Wednesday night Bible study. God bless you, High Point family.